Hi, good evening to one and all. This is Sri from Full Futures once again. And thank you for joining us tonight. Today, we're going to be talking about the commodities to watch in 2020. As we know, in uh, based on the uh, outline for the webinar, 2019 and early 2020 has been marked by volatility in the commodity markets, with investors reacting to headline news and market sentiment rather than the fundamentals. Commodities like iron ore, crude palm oil, and palladium have had spectacular rallies, and 2020 was looking like it was going to be a better year for most commodities expectations of uh, global growth and better trading relations amongst the trading giants. However, the coronavirus situation and fidelities uh, with the disease have put a damper on economic growth and subsequently cooled demand for commodities in the affected countries. While the cooling demand may cause prices of these commodities fall severely through the inventories, even though the inventories are in short supply, how would these uh, key commodity products position themselves in the weeks ahead. Would the geopolitics in the Middle East continue to be the main drivers? Can CPO break new historical highs? And will palladium continue peaking? Would the coronavirus ensure rubber prices don't bottom up bottom out rather of its three year downtrend? Here to tell us more and give us the insights to these uh, commodities and uh, where the prices may be headed is none other than our senior commodities manager, Mr. Aftar Sandhu. All right, Aftar, over to you to give us the insights right now. All right. Thank you, Sri. Uh, very good evening to those online. Uh, just to start off, if you are looking at the screen right now, the picture is the one of the culprit that has caused a lot of volatility in the market is just a picture of the virus that have run havoc in the many countries okay uh, before we even begin the usual disclaimer of, uh, I'll give you a minute to read it. Okay, as uh, Shri has pointed out the theme for this seminar itself, the primary thing to know is the key to all this would be how the virus itself would affect real economic growth and how it will impact uh, prices, especially in China, and also on the knock-on effects on the rest of the world. And the key question to ask is, will the turning point of the number of new cases be soon, although we do hear reports of uh, number of new cases falling from the previous day, uh, will this trend continue? And we'll see once it continue, how we will affect prices. Next, uh, just a brief agenda. We look at commodity overview, the top commodities that were uh, Stellar in 2019 and the key drivers that actually drove these commodities to new heights. Then we'll also look at the Chinese global slowdown and how it would affect commodities. And we will look at uh, the number of commodities that are listed there. Okay, let's look at uh, the top commodities in 2019, who are the gainers and the losers? Of course, the the most spectacular one was the Italian iron ore futures contract, then followed by palladium, then crude oil did very well. Also, the Malaysian the crude palm oil. We also have the base metals like nickel and Arabica coffee performing well also if you go down the line you see spot gold and few other agri contracts of course there were some contracts that did not actually do very well 
uh, among them was rubber, which we will cover later, and net gas. Okay, this year, not all commodities are doing badly. Uh, some of them have not really been affected by the COVID-19. Uh, sugar, for instance, has had a stellar performance this year. And this is particularly because of very poor harvest in Asia. And primarily sugar traders are also wondering why the macros are not affecting sugar, but it's primarily because we do expect a deficit this year in, in sugar. Okay, next thing, uh, COVID-19 is bound to end the global growth. This, this growth has been, I think, for 43 quarters. Um, the virus is going to cost practically according to capital economics estimates about 280 US billion dollars. For now, our best guess is that it will cost us only in the first quarter. If this assumption comes true, it will mean that the global GDP will not grow for the first time right? since 2009. Growth is how expected to pick up in the second half and hopefully in the late second quarter. Uh, containment measures that are having heavily on the Chinese economy would have been lifted by the stimulus. Of course, the great unknown here is would the virus stop spreading in China and the rest of the world? Okay, let's look at the growth of in China. It's primarily expected to be from down from 6% to 4% plus this quarter. Uh, and if you look at, compare it with the impact in 2003 of the SAR virus, uh, we find that the growth primarily dipped and then it picked up. Same thing here, uh, we do have a dip in Chinese growth and similarly a pickup. Uh, China is important for commodities because it accounts for about 17% of global GDP uh, and most of the largest trading partners are its neighbors. Besides that, we do, China is a huge importer of commodities. This Chinese dip in growth would affect uh, commodities countries like Australia and Brazil. China is also a large importer of crude palm oil and rubber itself. And if you look at the list of uh, imports that came into China in 2015, all the countries that are colored would be affected. Uh, for example, let's start with the Chinese province uh, in which the city in which you all started Wuhan. Hubei is the province. It is an important center for global supply chain and disruption there with the factories closed down, quarantines and travel restrictions would have uh, repercussions in the Asian supply chain. Uh, Asia imports about 40% of intermediate goods from China itself. And at this current moment, since China is the dominant supplier, it would be difficult for them to find alternative suppliers soon. This primarily, when we look at the effect on the Chinese economy, uh, we know that the market will not go into a V-shaped recovery despite uh, quite a number of stimulus and rate cuts by the Chinese government. Uh, 
most of these assumptions are based that the virus would be controlled by end of the second quarter this year. Uh, generally, we would see few drivers that we want to keep in mind, uh, primarily be sentiment, consumption, knock-on effects, on, and the stimulus itself. The Chinese and other central banks uh, have been, of course, been geared up with stimulus. The Chinese cut uh, the bank lending rate this afternoon also. Let's look at sentiment. Uh, market primarily now is trading mostly on sentiment itself and watching the number of new cases and whether the rate of new cases are growing or it is being tapered off and consumption okay so although we would return to trend growth once the virus is gone uh, do expect a recovery when the virus is gone because of all this pent up industrial demand that is being created by the slum. Next, uh, collateral damage. Of course, we know the commodities is badly uh, damaged. Consumption will be a one-off thing, but other sectors, the property sector, the corporate sector would also be affected, especially the property sector where which has uh, a lot of base metal being used for construction. Next, the stimulus. The government has, of course, promised quite a number of stimulus uh, to be delivered uh, this year until the economy targets are met. Uh, but uh, primary, what we see now are, of course, uh, continuous uh, stimulus but the concern is uh, for the Chinese is they don't want to repeat the same thing that happened in 2006 and which later on, uh, six, seven years later, led to other issues. As far as commodities are concerned, the virus itself had a different effect on the different categories of commodities. Okay, if you look at uh, energy itself, you find that energy has been the most badly affected. And if you compare it with the precious metal complex, you find that uh, it actually has gained from this uh, plunge in the prices in commodities in other sectors. Always difficult to estimate the scale and duration of this and how long it would continue, but do remember that stimulus packages uh, would have a limited effect and it would not be a no all. All right, we do expect markets to. Uh, To dip sooner or later, all right. But don't expect a bear market. We do expect a slight dip before uh, markets continue to have all this uh, stimulus uh, fully coming online. But gold itself, as a safe haven asset, has actually gained from uh, the virus itself. Okay, the agri and industrial complex, of course, uh, consumption will be badly hit uh, since China is a large, has a large share of agri consumptions. Uh, you find that it has, it's among this percentage share of world agriculture, you find it has a large share in cotton, soybean, rice, corn, wheat, and palm oil. Also, it's look at this consumption of other commodities. You find the ones that we're going to discuss today, jewelry uh, and palm oil, also having a large share. Okay, for 2020 commodities price check, these are the things that uh, generally we can summarize itself. The virus itself, which is bearish for 
the commodities. And before that, we know that going, as Sri has mentioned, going into the spread of the virus, we had the US-China phase one uh, deal, which was actually bullish for commodities. And of course, the Chinese stimulus is also bullish for commodities and US rate card, which would vary with different commodities and some commodities being neutral. And of course, we have large scale supply sh shortfalls like in sugar itself, which is actually bullish for the commodity. Let's go on to specific commodities. Let's go on to palm oil for a start. You know that palm oil had had a 43% stellar run uh, and it has retraced on the virus impact and many other factors. Okay, if you look at the chart itself, uh, palm oil already picked before the Indian imports curb the Malaysian palm oil on a diplomatic spat. Then came the news of the virus itself. And of course, uh, traders remembered that, okay, look, we have low production in January, the stocks are low. Uh, we have weak, weak production coming out of Malaysia and prices retrace up a bit. Okay, let's look at Malaysian palm oil production. It has been falling uh, recently. It has plummeted almost 1.17 million tons in uh, January. And if you look at the production as compared from in Jan 2019 and the expectation in Jan 2020, you find there is a significant difference. Same thing with ending stocks. Ending stocks are pretty low. It's uh, from 3003 right down to 1007 uh, this year. Okay, there are other supporting drivers. Uh, for example, the weather has been very dry in the, the third and fourth quarter of last year. And this dryness has affected yields in the palm oil. Okay, on further we have the B30 and B20 programs in Indonesia. B30 is where the gasoline has about 30% of uh, biodiesel. And uh, in Malaysia, we have the B20 program is 20% of the diesel itself. Uh, all these things have been soaking up a lot of demand for palm oil and has been supporting the market. Okay, next we just go on to Indian uh, palm oil imports. Uh, the Indian government has been uh, issuing licenses to to import oil from Nepal ever since the diplomatic spat where they actually advised uh, their traders to buy less from Malaysia itself. Uh, and But since India needs palm oil and the Indonesian palm oil has actually gone up to a premium to Malaysian palm oil, the Indian government has started importing a via a different route from uh, via Nepal itself. So what the Malaysians are doing, they export to Nepal and down to to India itself. Okay, next time uh, here we have the FGV, the Felder Rancher CEO. Uh, he's pretty bullish on the palm oil itself. Uh, he says that the, it's a report that the palm oil's blow to China is temporary in a sense that what he meant is the double whammy to palm oil demand, which right from the trade spread with India and the virus in China is likely to be only temporary uh, because supplies are low, fuel and food demand is still robust. 
and January to March this year will see low production. And it coincides with a period where demand is stressed up. So will demand correct itself and prop up prices? According to the CEO of Felder, Felder is uh, the largest, one of the largest Malaysian palm oil player. Uh, according to him, uh, demand will correct itself and prop up prices. He expects uh, spot CPO prices to trade in the range of 2,500 ringgit to 2,575 dollars a ton in the next three months and then off to 2,700 ringgit in the long term. This is another report where the, you find that Malaysians are still pretty bullish in palm oil. It's a research piece by the Malaysian uh, May Bank. Uh, they believe that this drop in virus is only temporary uh, in fact, more food stuff that uses palm oil will, in fact, help support the price. Okay, so let's look at the long-term chart of the Bursa palm oil contract. Uh, it has met resistance recently and had dropped off, and you find that it is retracing itself. Uh, palm oil normally have a range of about 2,000 to 4,000 ringgit per ton. And what we have now in the short run is uh, you find Bursa's CPO has been rammed into a triangle. Uh, we have support at 2,500 and which I believe that a lot of buying will turn up there. Uh, we do have uh, palm oil closing at the spot mark today at 2,585 ringgit, uh, well support at 2,500 ringgit holding up. We are not really pretty concerned about dip below the support as the fundamentals are still pretty robust. Let's go on to crude oil. The demand for crude oil is expected to wane as the Chinese economy slows as China is one of the largest importers of crude oil. Uh, previously, we have always looked at geopolitical tensions in the Middle East to affect the risk premium in, in palm oil. But now we have another new factor that affects it. With COVID-19 spreading, uh, oil market is entering into a new normal with demand being the key rather than uh, supply due to the risk factors. Although we still need to consider the risk as disruption as an important factor, most traders will now look at uh, the demand side of the story as to, uh, risk has uh, moved on to a structurally lower level. Okay, so crude as new dynamics, uh, price forecast of course has been lowered because of expectations of a larger supply as China, as we find that would need less oil than is was originally estimated. Uh, crude oil refiners have start to cut rate, run rates as to, uh, fuel and gasoline and other products will be less in demand as travel restrictions kick in. Next, we do find that all eyes in, are in OPEC plus, that is OPEC and Russia, and the quantum of cuts that it would mandate for its members. Uh, OPEC is going to have a meeting soon. Uh, most investors were earlier on expecting the meeting to be brought forward from March this year, but it looks like uh, the meeting will still be in large. 
in March, the Russian ruble is still strong, which actually limit the Russian hand in cooperating with OPEC itself. Surprisingly, the Chinese tea ports have come in to actively buy at lower prices. Uh, the Chinese tea ports are actually independent refiners and they do uh, buy a large chunk of uh, fuel on the open market. Next thing, the near-term cotango in crude oil uh, is actually already encouraging, encouraging storage of crude in tankers and containers for future delivery. Primarily, it's a trade where you buy oil and store in, in you buy into the future and you store oil and you deliver once it, the contract expires. We do need to look at four key drivers, uh, Middle East uh, oil production, uh, exports have slumped in recent years, and there are primarily, first, the Middle East share of global oil production have slumped. Uh, if you look at the chart, you find as a percentage of global uh, usage, Middle East exports have been drifting over the years. So it gives them less clout in determining the price of crude. Next, the US in introduced a new oil that was not available many years ago. Uh, we are talking about shale, where horizontal dr drilling and fracking technology have reduced the marginal cost of oil. And they are able, they are quite nimble, they are able to increase or decrease production at short notice. Thirdly, we find that global stocks are very high. Uh, primarily, they are at historical highs for the past 10 years. Next thing, fourthly, demand growth is likely to be structurally weaker in the future as to, uh, the economies of India and China, which are huge importers, weakens. Next, we look at three keys to trade palm oil. If you look at one is the physical supply can be disrupted intentionally, right? Whether by OPEC oil embargo or the Arab war in 2008 or event like a global recession as in 2008. But you find that prices do tend to revert back to the mean or the fundamental price. Secondly, we find that demand is affected as oil consumption drops. Thirdly, there is a lot of uncertainty as to the outlook for supply and demand. Although the sentiment for the oil market has become bearish as demand drops, still we find we have comments from the Chinese leadership that goals and economic target set to be met by 2020 and will be met. Uh, thus, we would find that oil would start trading back to its norm when the virus effect has been fully met. Talking about the virus, uh, briefly here are the similarities and differences to SARS. The I'm sure most of you would have to, uh, read about all this by now, but what need to be pointed out is currently we have the social media that is more likely to exaggerate the spread as well. And you find that during the SARS uh, 2003 period, we find that growth actually recovered very fast. Next, we have the deeper cuts that OPEC has been talking about. It's not a deal that has been formed. Most of them would want 
to wait for the meeting in March to confirm that it's a done deal. And we, what we have noticed is that OPEC production actually fell sharply in January, mainly due not to the cuts by OPEC, but rather to disruptions in supply in Libya and Iraq. Saudi production have actually increased despite the splash to cut 500,000 barrels per day. Thus, OPEC is not as united as it seems. In addition, uh, OPEC has revoiced down its forecast for world oil demand in 2020 to account for the impact of COVID-19. All this suggests that OPEC may not be as united as it seems and may not be as swift to deepen output cuts following the COVID-19 outbreak. Accordingly, it appears that unlikely the OPEC would be as influential in the oil market as it had been previously. Okay, let's look at the WTI weekly futures traded on NYMEX. Uh, ever since January, we find that the $50 a barrel support has been holding, right? All at $50 a barrel is considered cheap. Uh, that's why you find the Chinese teapots coming in to buy once uh, the oil had hit uh, $50 a barrel. Uh, we, similarly, we brand, uh, brand dip a bit below the $55 a barrel uh, support, but it has recovered. And what we would see now is more range trading within this this range. Uh, maybe dine uh, dip between fifty four dollars a barrel to right up to sixty dollars a barrel for the brand itself. Let's go on to to gold. Gold has been in fashion lately, uh, not only in the, the futures market, but also in the fiscal market. If you look at the futures market, you find that open interest on COMEX, all right, which is part of the CME group. You find the open interest has increased uh, tremendously, indicating interest in, in the market itself. Also, the funds are also in the market. Uh, they are pretty long. according to the CFTC readings. And further, gold as shine as a safe haven. You find that gold is normally moving in line tandem with the treasury yield. If you look at the inverted curve, you find that the lower the yield, you find the stronger the gold priced. Next goal, the US dollar and the gold price has moved in inverse directions. You find gold inversely related to gold, but this time you find gold and the US dollar moving in tandem. Thus, gold has benefited as a safe haven from all this uncertainty. Next, besides this uncertainty, we find the role of central banks in gold, which must always be considered since they are the single largest holder of gold. You find, the, in fact, the largest holder of gold reserves is the US Federal Reserve, which accounts for about 23.4% of global holdings. The central banks have been always been active in the gold market. Uh, the developed country central banks have signed an agreement in 2010 limiting their role in the market in the sense that each central bank uh, 
can only sell about 500 tons of gold a year. Whereas other central banks that are outside this agreement, that is the undeveloped or the less developed country central banks can sell or buy gold up to an unlimited amount. Ever since they have signed this uh, central bank agreement, it's now the fourth agreement itself, you find that cent developed country central banks are normally buyers of gold rather than sellers itself. On a net basis, central banks have been sellers, not sellers, but the buyers of gold. If you look at gold itself, you find that we have key drivers, normally inflation expectations, dip in growth, and of course risk. And often risk stands out. But once the risk is reduced, we find that uh, gold reverts back to its mean when before the risk uh, erupts up. Okay, if you look at the Gulf War itself, you find that uh, the spot gold price appreciating uh, in line with the crude oil itself. And during the 9-11 the attacks, you also find spot gold uh, cumulating upwards together with oil. Okay, but this time it's different, all right? This time gold has decoupled itself from oil. You find that uh, crude oil has dropped to uh, quite a bit on $50 barrel, whereas uh, gold is making new highs. Next, let's go back to China and India, which are huge buyers of physical gold. A slowdown of uh, physical purchases would definitely drag down gold demand itself. Uh, you find that in this case, uh, the high price of gold is primarily more due to speculative demand rather than physical demand itself. Or if you look at the speculative uh, chart of gold in the futures in COMEX, you find that it has been on a run since uh, 2015. This is where it is making new highs uh, ever since 2013. Next, you find the, if you look at the weekly chart of gold, you'll find that $16.20 an ounce uh, has been the recent high. Uh, we do have very strong supports at 1,500. And of course, the this 1,150 is the nearest support that we have for gold. The next support that is at 1,500. But I don't envisage gold uh, moving down there soon. What the down, the the upside risk is should be considered more than the downside risk. Uh, if the spread of the virus is not contained, uh, we would see 17,000, sorry, 1,700 an ounce level soon. But this expect gold to consolidate uh, just around the 1,600 ounce level for the time being. Okay, looking forward, if the virus eventually is brought under control, of course, gold inflows will slow down, right? Uh, but central buying buying will be still be strong, uh, purchase will be less than 2019. Slow down in physical purchases in China would be one of the key factors that will be dragging down demand. Okay, assuming that the virus is brought under control, uh, all this effect of ultra loose monetary policy will lift global growth in 2020 in the second half. 
and of course they would envisage uh, software and risk aversion and weigh on bold investment. A recovery in economic growth in the US of course would notch up the value of a dollar which would in normal cases be negative for gold demand. However, if COVID-19 takes longer to eradicate, it is going to cost uh, inflation. Uh, lower interest rates would come on. And of course, this uncertainty would all be good for gold prices. Okay, if do expect gold prices to notch higher before a large retracement sets in. Let's look at uh, the next precious metal, palladium. Palladium has, has been in a bull run for some time. The rally has probably run its cost. Uh, the Chinese have really been importing palladium because of their 6A program. The market for palladium is in deficit. Demand growth looks solid. However, we find that because of Chinese demand, palladium has been in a structural deficit. The pressure has been in upward prices. Palladium, as you know, is been used as an auto catalyst in car sales. If you find the Car sales had been dipped off since the beginning of 2019. Uh, we have some recovery in the, on the global scale as well as in China itself. The global car sales is also another key to palladium demand. Okay, the price of palladium has rallied in January we find that with the expectation that there's going to be economic growth because of the phase one deal. However, we find that palladium would have a problem prevent because of a material supply response. Uh, we find that palladium forms a low percentage of the companies uh, materials that actually mine palladium. Uh, these are the major palladium miners. Uh, we find that palladium actually is a small percentage of their revenue itself. But however, the market is in deficit and that would continue to support palladium price. And of course, here you find the bull run in palladium itself. Uh, buying on dips has been a favorite strategy uh, every time the market dips. But we do feel that because of the slowdown in general in the markets itself and for the 6A program in China itself, the buying has already been factored in. But I would say uh, markets uh, prices would still stay elevated. Let's generally look at the outlook for Palladium itself. Uh, we do expect price gains to, uh, whenever the market dips. For as I mentioned, uh, the front loading for the China 6A has already been done. Uh, the market is undersupplied in the foreseeable futures. Of course, because of COVID-19, the tourist and transportation sectors has been badly affected. Uh, we would see a dip in these sectors and that would affect the, of course, the purchase of cars and vans and other vehicles. And that would affect uh, Palladium, but because of the structural deficit in the market, it would have, to, it wouldn't create, I would say, a bear market in Palladium itself, but we would expect a slight dip. 
Okay, let's go on to rubber itself. Rubber has been a bear as compared to paladin, which has been a bull. It has been in a bear since 2010. Uh, and with this bear, I mean the coronavirus, would it, is there room for prices to fall further? Let's look at some of the fundamentals itself. Uh, world supply fell about 0.7% in 2019. Uh, there is fungal disease in Thailand and Malaysia that's affecting supply. Uh, the world supply is going into a seasonally low in January with the wintering program, which well, not program the wintering effect, which anyways is annual shedding leaf of rubber trees. Next, let's look at consumption. Our consumption is also down by 1%. Uh, world consumption of natural rubber tracks trends in global economy and the automobile sector. Automobiles have played a large part in rubber itself. Uh, the, the sector accounts for 75% of world demand for natural rubber itself. We find that if it, vehicle sales uh, falling, passenger cars in China also dropping, all this have add up to a drop in demand for rubber. Among suppliers, exports have also fallen about 6.5% in 2019. Uh, this has affected by has been affected by lower demand in China and India, which are the two largest natural rubber consuming countries. However, with the possible scaling down of consumption in India and China, it will dim the export from these uh, major suppliers: Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Cambodia itself. So let's look at the drivers that are pressing and pulling on rubber itself. The phase one deal between China and US has been good for rubber. World supply is now entering a seasonal low and the fungal disease is affecting yield and production. Then we have on the other hand, the majority of Chinese provinces reporting lower economic growth uh, we have the COVID virus aggravated the Chinese outlook. IMF also downgraded in the Indian outlook for 2020 and 2021. We have progressive uh, increase in inventories. And of course, we have a strong US dollar. Then let's look at Tokom rubber prices. Uh, rubber is traded on the Tokom exchange. Uh, we find that rubber has been in ranging from 2006 yen per kg to 155 yen per kg, especially with the drop. It has been in the bear market and with the bad news coming out from China itself, we would expect rubber to range down to its and try its low end itself. But we find that ever since the stimulus packages announced by China, we had a recovery in rubber prices from the bad news. Right. We do expect rubber to range, uh, but with all the stimulus packages that are being put up by the Chinese authorities, uh, all these stimulus packages in the past have been good for rubber itself we do we do not expect uh, rubber prices to rally but we would find that they would rather test the upside rather than the downside with that uh, uh, are there any questions that you would like to put forward Well, thank you so much, Ofta. While we wait for the questions to flood in, 
Um, I just would like to say that uh, if you have any questions that you like address on commodities, this is the right time to do so. Just type them in the question box and we'll get uh, through them. Uh, first up, we have a question from uh, Penny. Uh, she's asking, what are your thoughts about the resistance and support for crude oil and gold? All right, uh, let's look at the WTI the, that is traded on the NYMEX exchange. Uh, we are looking, although sentiment had been bearish, but with the amount of stimulus that has been put in the market itself, we do feel that could all near-term futures at $50 a barrel would be supportive. Uh, OPEC is meeting in March itself. Uh, they are also pretty concerned about the dip in prices in oil itself. For NYMEX, I would say that uh, WTI at $50 a barrel is cheap. And of course, uh, we don't expect oil to rally up to $70 a barrel for the WTI itself, but uh, do expect uh, buying on the dips once the uh, support is being tested. Well, well the next sorry. question we have okay. is from Michael Fern. Uh, the question is, uh, any update or any thoughts on silver? On silver. On silver. Silver, I would say that would be a better bet on the later half of the year. A gold has benefited more than silver now, but gold being just a precious metal and silver being more of an industrial as well as a precious metal is going to be more it's going to get more benefit than gold itself in the later half of the year once uh, all this pent up industrial activity kicks up because of the stimulus in china okay next question we have from prakit the question is how about other metals like copper and aluminium it's the same story as silver itself, uh, aluminium and copper itself are metals that in China itself would be affected. Of course, both are used in construction and in, in the industry itself. We would find that the support would come from the stimulus package and because of the drop in demand uh, these commodities have been badly affected but however as the chinese promised stimulus to stir the economy up to meet up the targets set up to end 2020, uh, we will find that both of these industrial metals would pick up demand, I would say, towards the end of the second quarter this year. All right, so the next question is from Murali Duran. But um, okay, that, that being a futures company, we can't really address. Um, uh, counter related questions so I'm so sorry about that uh, but if you like to rephrase your question to uh, be more sector specific or product specific uh, we'll be pleased to address it uh, next question is uh, we're going to address is uh, from uh, Prokit once again um, as a tool for uh, trading commodities um, how does uh, futures compare with the ETFs in your opinion after all right. It's difficult to compare Apple with Apple kind of thing. Uh, both has its advantages and disadvantages. One must look at one's own uh, outlook. 
uh, ETFs, of course, uh, futures are traded on leverage itself, which is actually a double-edged sword. Uh, for ETFs itself, uh, it's also a derivative, but uh, for ETFs, you pay the full value of, of course, the the units that you are buying, whereas uh, for futures itself, uh, we do have uh, a lot of advantages, right? It's that most of them are exchange traded, uh, the huge liquidity itself, and most of them are traded round the clock, whereas a lot of times ETFs are only traded within certain hours of the day. All right, I was just reading an article about this uh, today, I believe, from Bloomberg. Uh, after the question for you is, do we need to worry about the local swamps in uh, Africa impacting agricultural prices such as crude palm oil and others? Africa has not really been a dominant player in the agri sector. Uh, most of their production has been for domestic purpose. Of course, we have to worry because the local swamps are eating up uh, trees and crops that are meant for food. But Africa has really not been a huge dominant player in the agri sector. Uh, the parts of Southern Africa that like Egypt itself, which actually is a big uh, factor in 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 when we look at Africa itself because they grow and they need wheat on a large scale whereas for the others uh, agri has not been really agri in Africa I would say is not uh, would not affect prices around the world All right, so the last question for today, we're going to, going to go back from uh, to goal. Uh, this question is from uh, Wong Yy. All right, so we uh, you foresee a large retracement of goal. Uh, I believe this is probably after the virus situation is stabilized. And uh, what's your best uh, uh, forecast for a low and very low, assuming this is after 1,700? Gold, the dynamics of gold have changed, I would say, ever since the, the present president of took office in the US itself. Gold has been looked as a safe haven, and also it has been used as an alternative. To of course, the bottom line for gold is around a thousand ounce, a thousand dollars an ounce. But that is when we look at the production cost of gold. But that is a way we oft. Otherwise, we would find that buyers, of course, the long-term buyers of gold, would uh, come in at thousand four hundred dollars an ounce, even $1,500 an ounce would be an attractive place, uh, area where one would consider buying gold. All right, thank you for being a wonderful audience today. Uh, we absolutely love the questions coming in today. And um, we will be sending a, a recorded link to this webinar so we can revise what we have covered for today as well as um, any other uh, promotions and uh, and, and where details on where you can send your queries to. All right, so uh, details on uh, upcoming product launches will be shared with you in our follow-up email as well along with the link of the webinar. Thank you for being a wonderful audience and we'll catch up with you in our next webinar. Next one we have uh, will be coming up real soon, so keep a lookout for uh, webinar details. All right, have a good night. Bye-bye.